Now we're ready for 17. Routine and ritual. Unlike some uh, accusations against al Pidarkai not being structured or even using the term Hefkerus, really, it's extremely structured. Well, it should be. Uh, starting with what I call routine and ritual. What does that mean? You want the children to have the sense of confidence in the system. Confidence that the teachers know what they're doing in moving them along the curriculum. And one of the ways you can build that is with structure. We've mentioned this before. Structure always precedes function. And if you really want function to be at its optimum, then that will depend on to what extent there's structure in place for the function to be maximized. And the more the structure exists, the easier is the function more efficient, more progress, more real the function will be. So over here, the structure part is routine and ritual. Start the day the same way every morning. The kids know exactly what the expectations are. And this is again, this is all like Derek's suggestion. I'm not saying this is etched in stone. You will tweak it to the needs of the class. Not every year the class are the same type of children. You're going to tweak it as even during the year it will be different. But the essential structure is what I'm offering you here. In number one, routine and ritual, the children know that as soon as they walk in the classroom, no matter how early or late they are, they know the routine is they have to remove their knapsack, this is where it goes. It doesn't get thrown across the class. It doesn't get dropped on the floor or put underneath their uh, chair where it could stick out and someone could trip over Hasfa Shalom or tear the strap off. No, it's, it's hung in a specific place, as is the coat of each child. Routine and ritual, settle in the classroom. Routine and ritual means that at a certain point every morning, everyone knows that we begin davening. So that really should be the number one on routine and ritual. When I say should be, I want to leave room for the possibility that you will start the day actually with, I'm not going to call it recess, but with exercise, where the kids to possibly music, a little bit on the groovy side, like with a good beat, would actually um, do a routine and ritual of moving their arms. Of course, you have to have the kids far apart enough to be able to do this. And doing this, it could be going faster and faster and faster and faster. You only actually need to do this for up to 30 seconds or 60 seconds max to very enjoyable, upbeat music, delightful music, especially if you've got words which are endearing in Yiddishkeit, in order that their metabolism is really you know, excited moving so that as soon as you start davening, it's not lethargic, but it's real. You're energized. Every bone in my body is screaming out, who's like you? Who's as great as you? So um, I'm not suggesting that the exercise should be Shalom seen as something that you're giving priority over davening, I'm suggesting the opposite. I'm suggesting that this should be a hachana to davening, to get the body energized. And the kids could look forward to doing this first thing in the morning, and then you go straight into davening. Now, davening is routine and ritual. I'm going to say this really very as fast and as clearly as I possibly can. Please follow the instructions in building block number seven, which is living tefillah. We're dafka looking not to make davening something that we are programming the child to hate. Uh, if you want more information on that, I strongly advise you to read a book entitled The Frum Revolution. Uh, the author there explains brilliantly the danger of not having children understand what they're saying by doing rote davening. You can get it on amazon.com, The Frum Revolution. Brilliantly written, happens to be my firstborn son who wrote it. Uh, but even that aside, um, Rabbi Akiva Tatz, who is a brilliant mind and extremely uh, acutely aware of detail and not necessarily easily impressed, is extremely impressed by it. He wrote a, a beautiful thing at the back. I know this sounds like a commercial, but I'm trying to bring out, read that book to get a full flavor and understanding of the danger and the poison we're creating by not letting children have what the intent of tefillah really is, kavanas alev. 
that the, the mind is engaged in the words that we're saying. And if we're almost training our children not to know what they're saying, where they're robotically, mechanically saying words that they don't really understand, they're disconnecting from the Kodesh Baruch Hu in the name of connecting. So for the routine and ritual for davening, you're going to spend maybe five, ten minutes max probably on the actual davening of words they already understand and know. Starting with Moite'ani, thanking Hashem for our neshama, Birkas Hashacha, and thanking Hash Kodesh Baruch Hu for each part of our body, Pukeachivim for our eyes, Malbisharumim for my clothes, thank you Hashem, I know you love me, Zoykev Kifufim for my spine and my nervous system. Please check out building block number seven because you can see it all over there. Spend first five minutes, ten minutes max on the davening you already know, the kids already know. That frees up the next 10 15 minutes of what we would have spent doing davening without knowing what we're saying, which we don't want to do. Now that time has been freed up, we're going to learn the next part of tefillah, which we will now understand, learn to appreciate, learn what the words mean, and learn uh, beautiful messages in each part of that davening. See building block number seven for much more detail, and of course the manual. After that, number four, a class meeting, where you meet as a classroom, all the kids in a circle, or if the desks are configured in a ches, or a semicircle, then what you're going to have is a class meeting, which doesn't have to take a long time, it really depends on, on the kids, where if there's anything that the children want to discuss, and you help them identify the purpose of class meeting, which doesn't have to be every morning, um, simply is the following. Are there, are there any things that's happening in the classroom that you want to tell me um, needs to be fixed, uh, changed, improved upon? Anything during recess that you want to make a, a point about? If a children wants to hand in an index card about an issue they want to speak about but want it to be uh, anonymous, they can do that. Uh, you can probably tell from the handwriting who's giving it in, or if they want to meet you privately to tell you uh, they want you to bring this up at the next class meeting. The purpose of these class meetings is for the children to realize my teacher is here for the benefit of all of us. It's all about us, it's not about him. It's not imposing his rules on the classroom, it's about us learning to live together and learn together as a community, a tzibur, chabura, chevra. That's what we're learning to be, we're learning to get along together. So the class meeting is really to keep in check. Is there anything that we need to discuss that's not working in the classroom? If you want to start off on the upside, the positive, then you can go around the classroom and ask the children to share anything that they want to say that they are enjoying about this class, that they are enjoying about each other, about their complimenting about the work cycle, achievements that they're noticing others are making, what they're enjoying about recess. Let, let them, in class meetings, come out with what's working and ask them what's not working. If we're going to follow the logic that I have a right to say what's not working, I should follow the logic of also telling you what is working, because we can't stay just on the negative. So you can bring that out also as part of the purpose of the class meeting, is that you want the kids to remind themselves about how good it is in the school, in this class, with the Rebbe, with our friends. And if you want to make an actual ritual, it doesn't have to be every single morning, it could be two or three times a week, where the children will take turns to read out a note of what they've written about someone they admire. I admire Chaim because, and fill in the blank, I like Moshi because, what I like a lot about, or one of the many things I like about Mordechai is, and let them read that out in class, and collect these as memorables for building the children's tzibur, building literally a culture of supporting each other and noticing what we like about each other. And we'll discuss the problems, challenges, as something that the tzibur in the classroom, we want to bring to each other's attention. Oh, the, the, Moshe is complaining that during work cycle, he feels the, the sound level is too high. Um, Chaim is complaining that there's not enough of um, fruit or vegetables in snack. Or at the end of the day, the one in charge of the shelves is noticing that things aren't put back on the shelves properly because the next morning he comes in, he can't find what he put away. So, you know, let the kids bring out challenges and then let's discuss together solutions. So it's not about bad-mouthing, it's not about looking for the negative, it's about sharing how do we improve what's not working best for all of us. And by having that type of a culture in the classroom, is really growing the kids into leaders. People who are paying attention to the needs of each other. That's what a leader does, hopefully. Um, it's turning the kids into a group of caring, collaborating team players, which is really what 
a chave is supposed to be. Chave literally means, uh, from the word chibur, chave means to come together, to join together, to become one, jointly coexist. And that's what we want to bring about through these class meetings. So I would say you don't need to have them every morning. You can call it, let's say, three times a week and as is needed. But let the children be in control dangerous term I'm using, let the kids be in control of bringing to your attention, I would like to call, uh, call a class meeting because ABC. And if that's not enough for you to bring a whole class meeting right now, so uh, because you've got other things on the agenda, you'll tell them, oh, so as soon as we, I set up the next class meeting, this will be the first thing on the agenda. Or if you, you, need, you need to have more than this one item to discuss, you might push it off for two days or whatever. But as long as the kids know they have a voice, they know that they count, they know that what they're concerned or worried about was not working for them, there are ears to listen. And it's not about putting down anyone, it's not about complaining, it's not about accusing, it's not about denying, excusing, it's all about collaboration. It's all about, there's a problem, let's put it on the table, let's deal with it. How can we deal with it? How can we solve this? How can we find better solutions? This solution that we came up with last week or two weeks ago is not working because how can we fix that? So these are, these are beautiful ways that routine and ritual, every week the kids know there's going to be at least one to three class meetings uh, to discuss anything that needs to be discussed. The, the teacher themselves can call a classroom saying, this is what's not working for me as a teacher in the classroom. And let, let the kids brainstorm together uh, for solutions. The kids are mature, they're intelligent, they'll be able to rise to the expectation of being leaders and carers and collaborators, team players, as opposed to being jealous of or being angry at or resentful and building that up because there's no place in the school for me to, I don't want to use the word vent, but to bring to anyone's attention, this is not working for me or for the class or for the teacher. So that's the purpose of class meetings. Okay, we're still in number 17, which is routine and ritual. We cover putting your coat away, number one, number two, a quick workout, number three, to fill out number four, class meeting, number five. We'll do a very fast, and it really doesn't take more than a minute, routine and ritual of the four banners. We'll go through all four of the four colored banners and we sing it in unison together as a class. Vav and hey the, and we just go through all the items on the prefixes for the brown banner. Then we'll do the Chaf family the, and all the other families on the yellow banner. Do the red banner, future tense, blue banner, past tense. It only takes a minute to quickly review all of them every single day. And you're saying each prefix, each suffix with its touch. Number six, routine and ritual, you'll do a quick review of all the shirashim that you're up to. So if you've done uh, three to five every day and you're five days into the school year, you've done about max maybe 25 new shirashim. So you're going to chaza quickly review 25 shirashim. If you've got a Smart board, you can do it on the smart board. If you have a projector, you can do it with a projector on a screen. Very quickly, click one, two, three, and literally, I would say you're doing about two to three shirashim words a second. It goes very quickly. Rosh, head, my waters, are its land. Is it going to go very quick? Uh, if you have a word wall, uh, you can have turns where the kids will take turns after the, eventually the teachers start off the school year using a laser pointer or a flip chart where you have about 12 words per chart and you just quickly point to those words on the wall or on the flip chart and turn it over after every 12 words. But you're doing quick Hazara. You can literally do about 300 shirashim in about four minutes. No guzma, no exaggeration whatsoever. It can even be a little bit less than that, but four or five minutes, easily do that. Routine and ritual, every day we review all the free fixes on the four banners. Every day we review all the shirashim that we've done up until now. Then we do number seven, routine and ritual. We'll quickly review all the tarik mitzvahs that we're up to till now. So you can do easily a hundred mitzvahs in about a minute. It sounds crazy, but it's really true. Because if you're learning the code word of each mitzvah, you can pull it up on screen with a picture, that image of that particular stick figure, or if you're using the photo version for the older grades, you can pull it up and in a second, a split second, the kid sees the picture and the code word and screams it out loud. Tfil and shel rush, tfil and shel yad, sitzit, lulav. Mezuzah, etc. It goes very quickly. Quick Hazara every day. This is not learning. This is routine and ritual where the children are learning that 
we start the day and we quantifiably review, quantifiably, how many prefixes I know, suffixes, how many shurashim, how many tarig mitzvahs that we've learned and now we're quickly reviewing. This whole routine and ritual shouldn't take more than half an hour. Every morning, the whole thing. From the time you hang your coats up, two minute workout, fill a five, ten minutes, you want to add on the rest of the evening later on after all the routine and ritual, you can do that too, split it up. Then we're going to do number four, a class meeting. Make it efficient. Help the children become really good at making meetings efficient so they don't have to end up um, giving up coffee when they uh, become board members because it was keeping them awake during the board meetings. I wonder why they call it board meetings. Mysterious, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I wonder if it's related to another word. Um, no idea. So uh, we want the kids to be efficient in running meetings. And then you go to routine and ritual of all the banners, prefix suffixes, all the shirashim, all the tarig mitzvahs. Seconds, just do it in minutes, very fast, no, no messing around. And the kids know I'm, do, I'm covering all this every day. And now number eight of routine and ritual, memory systems. You want to cover ground real quick. If they've been learning the memory system for Boratius, which actually is the same for all the rest of Chumash, so they'll know, oh, uh, Lamed Zion, 37, oh, that's Yosef being sold. Uh, number five, oh, that's the 10 generations from Adam till Noach. So if you want to go Kaseda, you'll start with Aleph, Briasa Elam, base. Perak base is Briasa Adam. Perak Gimel is the story of the Nachash. Perak Dalad is Kain killed Hevel. Perak Hay, 10 generations from Adam to Neach. And you do this every day. You start from the beginning of Bereshit to the end. It shouldn't take you more, and it sounds crazy, than about seven minutes to Chazad the entire Chumash outline, skeleton. If they're doing the memory system, they'll know the basic information of what's in every single parak. Now, they're not doing this at the beginning of the year, you're just doing routine ritual. Every day you add on what you learned till now. But the idea is a cumulative review. You're constantly re-gifting the information in routine and ritual every morning, and it goes fast. You're not asking the kids to be paying attention to the same thing that I'm talking to you about for 20, 30, 40 minutes. Oh, that's so boring. When's the Rebbe gonna stop talking and talking and talking? Uh, right, will this be on the test? So, um, I'm not trying to put down the... I'm just sharing with you. Get the kids engaged, because over here, you are the conductor of the orchestra. The kids are playing the instruments. They're the ones chazering. Prefix offices, shurashim, tarik mitzvahs, the memory system with the outline of the entire chumash. They're doing all the work. You are just the conductor. You are simply guiding and directing the show. But they're the ones who are playing. They're actively learning. They're not passively listening. They are actively doing the review of all these different areas. And number nine is TROP. They're going to review all the TROP, all the Tami Mikra that they've already learned. They're going to sing it out loud, Sof Pasuk and Asmachte, all the different parts, they're going to sing it, and it only takes, it should take less than a minute, the whole lot. So that's number nine. Number ten is the teacher will teach Halacha Yomi. So that you're going to get in building block number eight. We'll get to it in much more detail, but essentially Halacha Yomi means we're following Halacha. In Shulchan Aruch, it's really Tanad Be'el Yaw, Kol Ashona Halacha is, Tshnei Halacha is Bechol Yom Muftach Lo Yishu Ben Olam Haba. Hey, that's important. Anyone who learns two halachas every day, guaranteed, he is a candidate for Olam Haba. Why? Because of all the different limudim, of all the different types of learning, the one that you want the kids to become most sensitized to is Ratzon Abeira. How do I serve a Kodesh Baruch Hu? So the halachic applications, the legal applications of everything we learn, from Pasuk to Mishnah to Gemara, eventually has to translate into how do I be a Jew because of this? So every day from first grade up, we're going to learn two halachas. So that's going to be part of routine and ritual. That ends the morning routine and ritual. And now we transition into work cycle. Or if necessary, the Rebbe wants to give a group lesson. He'll give the group lesson and then we'll do work cycle. So these are the 10 parts of routine and ritual that the children will go through every morning as soon as they've come into the classroom. They know exactly the structure. They know exactly the expectation of what comes next. And it goes quickly. We move because most of this is Chazara. Apart from the school meeting, the class meeting, which is not necessarily Chazara, uh, and that's not every single day, 
and whatever you're going to add on in terms of the learning new parts of tefillah, but all the rest of it is routine and ritual. You're going to do chazara of everything you've learned till now very quickly. Kids know exactly what's coming. Okay, number 18. We're now up to transitioning from routine and ritual into either a class frontal teacher giving a group lesson to the whole class or into work cycle. Either way, number 18 is we're going to look at your achraya sheets. What does that mean? Your responsibility sheets or your portfolio. There's different names for it, but essentially it's very simple. What are you going to do during work cycle? Which materials are you going to work on in Taig Mitzvahs? Which materials are you going to work on in the Shrashim, the prefixes and suffixes? Which unit are you up to in uh, Climbing Hasinai workbook? Which, where are you up to in the Shrashim? Um, have you done all the string wrap works and have you done all the educational materials with the Yadids, with the fortune tellers? Have you done all the dice as Nagea to the Shrashim? Have you done the Gematria drawers? And domino, have you done the Gematria string wraps? Have you done the Gematria? So you're going to go through the menu of all the different areas of each part of the 10 building blocks. The kids have to identify where they're up to in each area. And now they're going to write, with the help of the teacher, what they're going to cover this week. So this is a meeting you're going to have after routine and ritual. And you'll have it with each individual child. As they go to do their works, you'll pull out one kid at a time, either on a Friday or this can be on a Monday, where you're going to go through their achraya sheets, their portfolio of all the different areas of the curriculum that they are up to and what they're going to choose to do this week. Oh, you're going to do three more units in Climbing Hasinai. Oh, you're going to do five cards in the command cards on Lush and Terra. Oh, you're going to uh, learn another 10 mitzvahs of tag mitzvahs this week. Which ten are you up to? And if he's going to Kaseda like the Rambam. So this number 18, after routine and ritual, is transitioning into the work cycle. The children are going to identify using their Achraya sheets where they're up to in the curriculum. And this becomes a very meticulous, very specific assessment tool. Where on their Achraya sheets, it's very clear where they're up to in every single area of the curriculum. So here's an example of a, an Achraya sheet, what we call a responsibility sheet, which means the child's name will go up here and Yoim Aleph, Beis, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, the child will fill in over here which unit he's going to do for Kriya or Shrashim, Milim, the Lashon Torah banners, he'll put maybe a Y for the yellow banner, strips, those are the Psukim strips which you're going to learn in the building block number one, Lashon Torah. Trop, that's the cantillation, the musical notes for the singing of the psukim, which the children will learn. And then the taich in chumash, which parak or psukim is going to do. And girsa in chumash, that means how many prakim or chapters he's going to review on his own or in a group of boys who are up to the same place. Havana in chumash, that's a whole template which you're going to see a DVD on, on how to teach chumash alpi darkai. Gematria, which works of gematria, which materials he's using for gematria. Tarek Mitzvahs, which Mitzvahs is up to, which is going to finish up this week for Yom Aleph, Yom Beis, Yom Gimel, etc. He doesn't have to fill in every single square, but he has to fill in which days he's going to do that particular area of the curriculum. Then you've got Tarek Mitzvahs, you've got Kasiva, handwriting, and timeline, all the timeline materials for contextual learning, and the memory system. And if the children are learning Navi, Mishnayas, Yomim, Tovim, so all these would be filled in. If you need more paper or bigger squares, that's very simple. You just enlarge it on the computer. Here's another sample. This is just on Shrashim only, meaning to say, student's name here. Has he done matching work for unit Aleph, Beis, Gimel, all the way till Yud Beis? It actually goes to Chaf Hei till unit 25. And has he done the memory game and dice and make Shurish booklet? highlighting sheets and show mastery to the Mora or to the Rebbe that he knows or has done all the Shrashim. So matching it, for example, is where they match the picture to the Hebrew and the English cards and a memory game that they'll play. These are names of different materials that the children will use and they are being checked off. Have they covered that this week and which days they're going to be doing it? Here's another chart. His name goes here and which of the 303 shrashim he's up to. So every morning we're going to learn about three new shrashim words, and every day we're going to review 
those words and the words that we learned till now. That's part of routine and ritual. And over here, during work cycle, the child will call over the Rebbe or the Murrah and tell them, I'm ready to be tested on this Shoresh. And so if they can identify that Shoresh in Chumash, in the Siddur, and the prefix of of various combinations, and they identify it every single time correctly, so you will check off each one of these little boxes for the particular number Shoresh, because they're numbered 1 through 303. All the templates for these uh, are going to be on the video which talks about assessments. How do we assess where the children are up to in every single area of the curriculum so that it's very specific and the skills are being identified, any blocks in the learning is, is clearly identified uh, and what they have learned and what they've reviewed, what they have recalled, what they can remember. So all that's going to be in the assessment video which uh, you can choose to watch whenever you like. And lastly, on the Achraya sheets, the portfolio that the child will have for the integrated curriculum. So some children will be doing this only in the afternoon, some will be mixing it up in morning work cycle, and some will be doing it in both morning and afternoon work cycle. Uh, this has been prepared by Mora Bassi Goldman, brilliant, brilliant uh, Alpi Darukai head teacher, both for preschool and in building curriculum for elementary grades. So this was actually prepared for fifth graders. This is their Achraya sheets, the integrated studies planner. So an example here is every single day, they're going to put the name and the date. This is the fifth grade and what they're going to be doing for math daily and language, spelling, science, reading comprehension, how to tweak them to the individual needs of each child in the classroom. So this particular one is for the integrated curriculum. It covers writing and spelling, language, math, science, geography, history. Okay, moving ahead, I think it's number 19. Rules of the bathroom. So, as you can tell, this is not what you usually start off the school year with, but it really is important because the more comprehensive you are in covering all these different issues for children in the first days, weeks of school, the more confidence you are injecting in the children that they are part of a structure that precedes function and that they're going to be able to function because of this structure. It's not super rigid and strict, but it simply is there. It's real structure. There are very specific expectations, including how we behave in the bathroom, what we do, what we don't do. So in the bathroom rules, number one is really it's a simon in Shulchan Aruch in Simon Gimel of Aruch Haim. I think it's Sif Yud Zion, which talks about the Issa de Oraisa of delaying going to the bathroom. So we did talk about this earlier on in this presentation, but we know it's an Issa de Oraisa of Baal Teshaksu not to be despicable, disgusting in Hashem's eyes. How? What does that mean? Because when there's toxicity in the body, waste in the body, and the body indicates to your brain that it's time to relieve oneself, from that moment onwards, if one cannot hold oneself in, that is an issa of Baal Teshaksu, where one is being despicable because one is, one is meant to be Kaddush. And in being Kaddish, that includes not having something on me or in me that needs to be expelled, ASAP. So a person should not delay the moment they have the sensation of needing to relieve themselves. And this is something we want to train the children in as well, that they are being trusted to trust their bodies. Trust your body when it gives you signals, whether it's thirsty or hungry, in this case, to relieve itself. So that's number one. Number two of this is that we want to teach the children that if they need to go to the bathroom, they don't need to ask our permission, they just simply need to go. Um, Again, this we did discuss, if it becomes a trust issue, then, then that becomes a discussion. But otherwise, you role model in advance why it is that you are trusting the children to go to the bathroom when they need to go. Number three of this, if you can possibly design your classroom to have a bathroom adjacent to the class, so that it's really a door in the classroom that leads to a bathroom, that would be, of course, ideal. And if not, if you're able to design it that way for the future, that's great. And if not, so the kid has to go to the bathroom themselves, depending of course on the age of needing, if it's preschool, obviously they need to be escorted. But right now, we're up to number four is, so how does the kid supposed to behave in the bathroom? So number one, we don't have to tell the kid what to do or not to do, but, but there's certain protocol you do want the kids to know. That number one, this is a place to keep clean. So what does that mean? If and when a mess is made, either from number one or number two, who is responsible? The child should clean up the mess they made. They should be very responsible about how to do it if they've got the right 
washing materials if necessary or the or paper etc to wipe up the mess afterwards to keep the seat clean and when they wash their hands how to wash their hands so in Montessori there's a whole lesson on how to wash your hands with pouring first of water on the hands and then the rubbing of soap put the soap down and washing the hands very thoroughly so that if there's any tsaya, if there's any waste product that's between the nails and the skin, uh, you want to try and dislodge that if necessary with a, a finger brush or I'm not sure what they call it in America. And wash the hands very thoroughly for a few seconds and then turn the faucet on to clean your hands. And now you'll do negavasa. Negavasa is meant to be done on clean hands. So coming out of the bathroom, first of all, we wash our hands with soap and water very thoroughly so that all parts of the hand and fingers are completely cleaned and washed with the soap suds and then you rinse your hands and now we pour nagel vasa and you show the children how we do nagel vasa and very important number five we leave the nagel vasa full for the next person it's just a simple chesed this is a practice that was initiated in i believe it was slobodka uh, it was also practiced and still is practiced in philadelphia shiva um, we want to make sure that our children at a young age also learn that for almost no cost you leave the tap running when you put the Nagel Vasa underneath it for a few seconds, turn it off when it's full and you've done a chesed, a mitzvah der reisa of after recha moicha of making sure that the next person has the Nagel Vasa ready for them. By washing, the clean, by washing the seat or cleaning the seat or making sure that that area is clean or the floor is clean if one made it dirt, dirty, that is also mitzvah deo raisa of chesed to your fellow Jew or fellow is of course a covered abrius. It makes no difference uh, what, what person it is, gender or male, female, Jew, non-Jew. It's still uh, a mitzvah deo raisa of simple chesed. It's also kiddush Hashem. There are many mitzvahs, which we can talk about another time, that are really related to uh, behaving correctly in the bathroom. After washing hands, dry them thoroughly. If you're using paper towels, most yeshivas do, then teach the children how to remove one paper towel at a time if they're, if they're kind of tight. So pull it on both sides so that one will come out at a time, hopefully. And only use one at a time. If, if one paper towel doesn't do the job, usually they're designed that one paper towel should be enough to absorb the water that's on the surface of two hands. And if you need a second towel, use a second towel. Otherwise, explain to the children there's a mitzvah de rice of baltashis, not to waste anything, not to destroy anything that is useful, and certainly not to waste something that is still productive and can be of benefit to someone. But over here, it's a waste of paper if one pulls out lots of paper where you only need one or maybe two sheets and five or six or seven or eight come out. We want to sensitize the children to the fact that they're acting with their inherits for themselves to other people by being in control of their lives, of their hands, of their actions. So pulling out one or two paper towels, drying one's hands properly and throwing it in the waste paper bin, or as you say in America, the garbage can. Um, I don't know, it just doesn't sound so uh, etiquettely, precisely polite, that's all. But never mind. So you throw it in the garbage can and Teach the children Asher Yatsa, of course, they'll know that from Living Tefillah. See building block number seven for that. Those are the protocols, if you want to call them, associated to the bathroom. Okay, number 20. Use adult vocabulary as much as possible during your class because that's how you're going to familiarize your children to new words that will build their minds, build their ability to communicate to themselves because they've got more vocabulary to talk to themselves with and more vocabulary with which they can communicate to other people. So it's not a small thing, it's really massive talking to children with adult vocabulary. And as we mentioned, in your employment agency part of the classroom, what you want to have is in the rotation once a week, once every two weeks, one of the kids is going to be the class scribe, the cipher, and one of their assignments will be any new vocabulary word which the teacher uses and goes around the class, either identifying where it is in the dictionary, which, what's the definition, that scribe, the class scribe, will now add it to the list of the vocabulary for that week, and every single week, um, at the end of the week or beginning of the following week, we will do routine and ritual, Remember we did it this morning, earlier on, that we do it first thing in the morning, routine and ritual, add English vocabulary words. 
at least once a week where the kids will do review of all the new words that they've covered. Um, this way, build their vocabulary. So each time a teacher will use a sophisticated word or adult type word, ask the children what they think it means. You will probably find one kid who does know the meaning. If not, um, ask them to check it out in a dictionary. There's a lot of really good dictionaries out there, um, and many of them are they're actually called visual dictionaries. So the children can actually see the definition and then a picture of it. This page opened up to a laptop, even have a Palm Pilot here, which I think you still get in um, souvenir shop in the Natural History Museum. Um, but you can also see there's a lot of definitions of different hmm, technology. Uh, there's a lot of good dictionaries out there. Here's one actually, which is um, a Hebrew visual dictionary, uh, which has also got amazing illustrations of different clothing, uh, parts of the house, and it's all labeled in English and Hebrew. So you can pick up a lot of modern Hebrew vocabulary. This dictionary is called Milon Chazuti, a visual dictionary. And this is also a big favorite in schools, is a Scholastic's uh, Children's Dictionary, uh, of course published by Scholastic, and is very well illustrated and simply explained. So this is really good for the early grades. And of course you can get a, a much more sophisticated dictionary for the older children. And as and when the children are ready for it, introduce them to the use of a thesaurus so they can check out similar words to the word that the teacher or Rebbe has used. And of course, the teacher Rebbe can also use a thesaurus. Okay, that's number 20. We're up to 21.